Hello again, everybody. This is Dan Clouser, and welcome back to the Journey of My Mother's Son podcast. Today, I'm joined with Dr. Debbie Silber, who's the founder of the Past Trail Transformation Institute and is a holistic psychologist. Debbie, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much. Looking forward to our conversation. No problem. Um, so you've done a TED Talk um, talking about past betrayal. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we've all have experienced some sort of betrayal in, in our lives. Um, tell me a little bit about what got you kind of going down this squirrel hole. Of <laughs> yeah, it's actually my second TEDx. The first one is stop sabotaging yourself. And, and in the work we do, we talk a lot about uh, sabotage. The second one was, um, do you have post betrayal syndrome? And you know, no, no one studies something like betrayal unless you have to. So uh, it's my 30, I've been in business 30 plus years, health, mindset, personal development. I had a really painful betrayal from my family, uh, thought I did what I needed to do to heal from that. And then a few years later, it happened again. This time it was my husband. So that was the deal breaker. Got him out of the house and, and looked at the two experiences, you know, thinking, okay, well, what's, what's similar to these two? Of course, me, what else? And I realized, you know, I, I, boundaries were always getting crossed and I never took my own needs seriously. And I kind of looked at it like if nothing changes, nothing changes. So here I was four kids, six dogs, a thriving business. And I said, going back for a PhD. And I I didn't know how I was going to pay for it. I didn't know how I was managed, going to manage it, but I knew something had to change. And it was in transpersonal psychology. That's the psychology of transformation and human potential because I was changing so much. I didn't quite understand what was happening. He was too, wasn't interested in looking at that just yet. And then it was time to do a study. So I studied betrayal. What holds us back? What helps us heal? And what happens to us physically, mentally, and emotionally when the people closest to us lie, cheat, and deceive? And that study led to three groundbreaking discoveries, which changed my health, my family, my work, my life. And what were those three discoveries that that changed everything for you? Sure. So at first I was studying betrayal and post-traumatic growth. And for those who aren't familiar, post-traumatic growth is like, I kind of look at it like the upside of trauma, how any trauma, death of a loved one, disease, natural disaster, whatever, leaves you with a new awareness, insight, perspective you didn't have. Like maybe you lose someone you love and you realize life is short, that kind of thing. But I had been through death of a loved one and I'd been through disease and I was like, hmm. The trail feels very, very different, but I didn't want to assume it was the same for all my study participants. So I asked them, if you've been through other traumas besides betrayal, is it different for you? Unanimously, they said, oh my gosh, it's so different. Here's why. Because it feels so intentional, we take it so personally. So the entire self is shattered and has to be rebuilt. Rejection, abandonment, belonging, confidence, worthiness, trust, you know, they all get shattered. Like when you lose someone you love, you miss them, you grieve, you mourn the loss. You don't necessarily lose your ability to trust, right? right? So that type of healing, I was like, you know, it doesn't quite qualify as post-traumatic growth. It's like, yeah, you need to rebuild your life, but you also need to rebuild the self. So I coined a new term, post-betrayal transformation, and that's the complete and total rebuild of your life and yourself after an experience with betrayal. That was the first discovery. And how do you go about rebuilding yourself after yeah. betrayal? That's the third discovery. You want me to get to the second one first? Let's do Okay. So, so I'm getting ahead of you. No problem. Yeah. So this, <laughs> I'll get to it. So the second one was that there's actually this collection of symptoms, physical, mental, and emotional, so common to betrayal. It's known as post-betrayal syndrome. And we've had about 80,000 people take our post-betrayal syndrome quiz on our site to see to what extent they're struggling. A few things about that. We've all heard time heals all wounds. I have the proof that when it comes to betrayal, that's not true. There's a question on the quiz that says, is there anything else you'd like to share? And people write things like, my betrayal happened 40 years ago and I can still feel the hate. My betrayal happened 35 years ago. I'm unwilling to trust. So we know that you can't count on time, even a new relationship, to heal a betrayal. It needs to be deliberate and intentional. But every few months, I pull the stats from the quiz just to see where people land. I'm happy to share them if that would serve. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
So this is men and women, just about every country is represented. Imagine figure like, you know, 70, 80,000 people, ready? 78% of them constantly revisit their experience. 81% feel a loss of personal power. 80% are hypervigilant. 94% deal with painful triggers. These are the most common physical symptoms. 71% have low energy. 68% have sleep issues. 63% have extreme fatigue. You can wake up, you're exhausted. You slept the whole night, it doesn't matter. 47% have weight changes. So in the beginning, maybe you can't hold food down. Later on, you're using food for comfort. 45% have a digestive issue. And that's anything from Crohn's, IBS, diverticulitis, constipation, diarrhea, bloating, you name it. The most common mental symptoms. 78% are overwhelmed. 70% are walking around in a state of disbelief. 68% can't focus. 64% are in shock. And 62% can't concentrate. So imagine, you know, yeah, you can't concentrate. You're exhausted. You have a gut issue. You still have to work. You still have to raise your kids. That's not even emotionally. Emotionally, 88% experience extreme sadness. 83% are really angry. Really common in a day to bounce back and forth between those two emotions. 82% feel hurt. 80% have anxiety. 79% are stressed. Just a few more. Here's why I wrote the book, Trust Again. 84% have an inability to trust. 67% prevent themselves from forming relationships because they're afraid of being hurt again. 82% find it hard to move forward. 90% want to move forward, but they don't know how. So with that last one, um, that probably seems to be the, the big one that they, you know, most of them want to move forward. They don't know how. So I guess that brings you to that number three. The third one. <laughs> and, and before I get there, I'll tell you, you, know, what's so when you think of these numbers, first of all, you didn't hear me say 20%, 30%. These numbers are high. What's, high numbers, yeah. Yeah. And what's even crazier about it is these stats aren't necessarily from a recent betrayal. These stats are from something that could have happened decades ago. So now imagine this, your parent who did something awful when you were a kid, your girlfriend and boyfriend who broke your heart in high school, whatever it was, that person may not even know, care, or even remember. And here we are decades later with the gut issues, with the anxiety, with the sleep issues, with the weight changes because of that. That's, that's the part that's just not right. But yeah. to answer your question, that was the third discovery. And this for me was the most exciting. And what we learned was, and I talk about this in that uh, TEDx, do you have post-betrayal syndrome? While we can stay stuck for years, decades of life, and so many people do, if we're going to fully heal, and by fully heal, I mean those symptoms of post-betrayal syndrome, like I just shared, to that completely rebuilt place of post-betrayal transformation, we're going to go through five proven, predictable stages. And what's even more exciting about that is we know what happens physically, mentally, and emotionally at every one of those stages. And we know what you need to do to move from one stage to the next. Healing is entirely predictable. I'm happy to share the five stages if you want. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Because it would have been really awkward if you said no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we're good. Debbie, thanks for joining the show. We'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> all right. See you. <laughs> Okay. So they're all mapped out in trust again. It's what our coaches are certified in. It's what we do within the PVT Institute. I'm going to give you a boiled down version of it here. Stage one is like a setup stage. And if you can imagine four legs of a table, the four legs being physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. What I saw with everybody, me too, was a real heavy lean on the physical and the mental thinking and doing, right? And not really prioritizing the emotional and the spiritual feeling and being. So you can imagine the table with only two legs, easy for that table to topple over. That's us. Stage two, shock, trauma, D-Day, discovery day. The scariest of all of the stages. And it's the breakdown of the body, the mind, and the worldview. So right here, you've ignited the stress response. You're headed for every single stress-related symptom, illness, condition, disease. Your mind is in a complete and total state of chaos and overwhelm. You cannot wrap your mind around what you just learned. This makes no sense. And your worldview has just been shattered. Your worldview is your mental model, the rules that 
govern you, that, that prevent chaos. Don't go there, trust this person, this is how life works. And in one earth shattering moment or series of moments, every rule you've ever held to be real and true is no longer. The bottom is truly bottomed out on you. And a new bottom hasn't been formed yet. So this is terrifying, but think about it. If the bottom were to bottom out on you, what would you do? You grab hold of anything you could to stay safe and stay alive. That's stage three, survival instincts emerge. It's the most practical out of all of the stages. If you can't help me, get out of my way. How do I survive this experience? Where do I go? Who can I trust? How do I feed my kids? Here's the trap though. Stage three, by far hands down, is the most common place we get stuck. And here's why. Once we figured out how to survive our experience, our trauma, because it feels so much better than the shock and trauma of where we just came from, we think it's good. And we're like, whew, okay, I got this. And because we don't know there's anywhere else to go, because we don't know there's a stage four or a stage five, transformation doesn't even begin until stage four. But because we don't know there's anywhere else to go, we start planting roots here. We're not supposed to, but we don't know that. So we start like parking ourselves here. Four things happen. The first thing is, and I'm sure you know people just like this, we start getting all those small self benefits from being, being here. You get to be right. You get your story. You get someone to blame. You know, you get a target for your anger. You get sympathy from everyone you tell your story to. You know, you get all these sort of benefits. And on some level that feels good. So you plant deeper roots here again. You're not supposed to, but you don't know that. Now, because you're here longer than you're supposed to be, the mind starts going to work. And the mind starts thinking things like, well, maybe you're not all that great. Maybe you deserved it. Maybe this, maybe that. So you plant deeper roots. Again, you're not supposed to be here, but you don't know. Now, because this is where you are, because these are the thoughts you're thinking, well, this is the energy you're putting out. Like energy attracts like energy. So now you're calling situations and circumstances and relationships towards you to confirm, yep, this is exactly where you belong. Gets worse, but I'll get you out of here. Because <laughs> it feels so bad, but you don't know there's anywhere else to go. Right here, we, we resign ourselves. Really, like, this stinks, but I have to get through my day. I have to, I have to work. I have to feed my kids, right? So right here, we start using food, drugs, alcohol, work, TV, keeping busy, whatever it is. Now think about this. We do this for a day, a week, a month. Now it's a habit, a year, 10 years, 20 years. Dan, I can see someone 20 years out and say, that emotional eating you're doing, that numbing in front of the TV, that drinking you're doing, do you think that has anything to do with your betrayal? And they would look at me like I'm crazy. They would say, it happened 20 years ago. All they did was put themselves in stage three and stay there. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah. That's what we do. And, and I found it so crazy that everybody seems to be, there are five stages and everyone is landing and staying in stage three. So my most recent book from uh, Hardened to Healed is just for stage three. It's like, people, you owe it to yourself to move through the stages. There's a roadmap, don't stay there. Anyway. If you're willing, willingness is a big word right here. If you're willing to let go of the small self benefits and everything you get from uh, hanging on, right? To that betrayal, grieve more than the loss, bunch of things you need to do. You move to stage four. Stage four is finding and adjusting to a new normal. Here's where you acknowledge, you know, I can't undo what happened, but I control what I do with it, right? Right there, even in that decision, you're turning down the stress response. Now you're not healing just yet, but at least you stop the massive damage you've been creating in stages two and stage three. Stage four feels like if you've ever moved to a new house, you know, office, condo, apartment, your stuff's not there. It's not quite cozy yet, but it's going to be okay. That's the feeling of it. And, but think about it. If you were to move, you don't take everything with you. You know, you don't pack those things and take with you the th anything that doesn't represent who you're going to be in that new space. And what I found was if your friends weren't there for you, you outgrew them right here. You don't take them with you. The misery loves company crowd, like all those kind of people, mm -mm, you don't take them with you. If they don't rise, they don't come along. Very common. Anyway, when you're in stage four, you're making it cozy, you're settling in mentally, you're making it okay. You move into the fifth, most beautiful stage. And this is healing, rebirth, and a new worldview. The body starts to heal self-love, self-care, eating well, exercise, things like that. You didn't have the bandwidth 
for that earlier. You were just surviving. No, you do. The mind starts healing. You're making new rules. You're making new boundaries based on the road you just traveled. And you have a new worldview based on what you see so clearly now. And the four legs of the table in the beginning, it was all about the physical and the mental. By this point, we're, we're solidly grounded because we're focused on the emotional and the spiritual too. Those are the five stages. Yeah. And I, I love that. And so really by, I mean, essentially by not letting go of past betrayal, I mean, we are slowly killing ourselves and driving ourselves to an early grave, right? <laughs> That's essentially what's happening. And then think about it. You know, we could spot an unhealed betrayal a mile away. Like for example, in your health and your work in your relationships, I'll see it in relationships in one of two ways. The first way is a repeat betrayal, right? The face has changed, but it's the same thing. And you think, what the heck? Why do I keep going from friend to friend to friend, partner to partner to partner, boss to boss to boss? Is it me? Yes, it is. Not in that it's your fault, in that it's your opportunity. There's a huge lesson needing to be learned, you know, whether it's you are lovable, worthy, and deserving, you need better boundaries in place, whatever it is for you, until and unless you get that. You're going to have opportunities in the form of people to teach you. Like, look at my own experience here. It was uh, the betrayal of my family and then my husband. Now, look what I did for me. The most dramatic thing I could think of was enrolling in this Ph.D. program. It, I had never done anything like that, but it changed my whole life. It changed everything. Uh, and just to close the loop on my own experience, in case anybody is like they don't like the open loops. Uh, rebuilding is always a choice, whether you rebuild yourself and move on. That's what I do with my family. Or if the situation lends itself, if you're willing, if you want to, you rebuild something entirely new with the person who hurt you. That's what I do with my husband. So not long ago, uh, we remarried each other. We married each other again, new rings, new vows, new dress. Our kids is our bridal party. Um, but with that death of the old, it allows for the rebirth of the new. So if you're having those repeat betrayals, it's because there was no death of the old you and of the old relationship. So right. repeat betrayals, classic sign of an unhealed betrayal. The other way is you, you know those people who put the big wall up. You're like, nope, been there, done that. No one's getting near me again. We think it's coming from a place of strength. It's not, it's fear. It's like, that was, I, I am not willing to feel that pain in my heart again. Mm-mm. You know, and we see it in health. People go to the most well-meaning coaches, healers, doctors, therapists to manage a stress-related symptom, illness, condition, disease. At the root of it, very often there's an unhealed betrayal. Like for example, I shared 45% of everybody with, you know, who's been betrayed has a gut issue. Well, you can go to the best gut expert on the planet, but if they don't know there's an unhealed betrayal at the root of it, you're only getting so far with that. Right. And then at work, you know, you, you want to be that team player, that collaborative partner, but the person you trusted the most proved untrustworthy. How do you trust that boss, that coworker, that partner shows up everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's tough to break those barriers down. I mean, you know, to get through those five stages, um, like you said, it, it starts with you making those, those decisions, but, um, in your studies, I mean, what, like, how, how are people moving through those stages? I mean, what, what is that timeline looking like? And I'm sure it's a, a wide range, but. Yeah, it, it has less to do with, like, for example, I, at, when I was doing the research, I thought, you know, you're not supposed to assume anything as a researcher. I was new at this. I was like, you know, the people who were the hardest hit would probably grow the least because they had so much more to overcome. That had nothing to do with it. Nothing. And in fact, there were three groups who did not heal. The ones who put their head down and said, I am not picking my head back up until I am out the other side. They blew the doors off of these three groups. The first group, this was the group, they just refused to accept their experience. They had their story. They were sticking with it. That was like the stage three, right? They're just, they're just the same misery loves company are coming around because they are talking about their story, talking about their story, talking about their story. They didn't heal. The second group, this was the group that was numbing, avoiding, distracting. So they ran to the doctor who maybe put them on a mood stabilizer or anti-anxiety medication. They started self-medicating, you know, with alcohol, with TV, with food, whatever they were doing. They didn't heal. The third group, 
this was the group where the betrayer had very little consequences. So whether it was out of not wanting to break up a family, um, religious reasons, that was a big one, financial fear, whatever it was, they just did all they could just to turn the other cheek, look the other way, try to get over it. I saw two things with this group. Number one, a further deterioration of the relationship. And the second thing was this group was the most physically sick. Your broken heart can't handle that. So, um, you know, I was shocked because there were people who, you know, you'd look at them and say, I don't even know how you were able to get out of bed with based on the trauma you've been through since the, the beginning. And they healed so much faster than the ones who were doing those other things. Yeah. And it, it seems like we, you know, we do live in a society where, um, you know, self-medicating and actually, you know, going to a doctor to, you know, be prescribed medication is the way we feel that that's how we cope with, with this sort of stuff. Um, that we numb. That's what we're doing. Yeah. So how, how do, and, and that, that's really like a, a societal trait. I mean, so how do we overcome that to just understand that it's a lot more holistic than just, you know, the way we've dealt with this unsuccessfully? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, here's the thing. I, I understand it may take the edge off. It may make the day a bit easier, but it's not without a price because without that medication or without that drink or without that food binge or whatever, the same situation is still there, right? So there's a, there's a, uh, it's a mantra that I've been, uh, I've been sharing with, with anybody I've worked with for over 30 years. It applies to every single area of life. And I, and I, I have a feeling this is going to help your audience too. You ready? And they may want to write this down. That's my way of saying, write this down. Hard now, easy later. Easy now, hard later. Take your pick. It's going to be one of those two. And when it comes to healing from betrayal, it is a question of hard now. The work is hard. We have a saying within the PBT Institute, face it, feel it, heal it. That's exactly what you're doing. But we don't like getting uncomfortable. We don't like it. So we, we go the easy route, which is I'm just going to know. I'm just not going to look at it. But then hard later, it's still there as opposed to hard now. Okay, here we go. This is, stuff is brutal. Easy later, we've healed. You know, take the classic example of the butterfly, right? The caterpillar doesn't just stick a pair of wings on and becomes a butterfly. Think of, think of what happens on some, I don't know, random Tuesday, whatever. The caterpillar is just done. It's just done being a caterpillar. And it hangs itself from a branch in order to die to the life it's known right? It's willing to be deconstructed, unrecognizable from anything it was. Only because it went through that messy process does it get to be the butterfly. It can't become that if it's unwilling to go through that messy process. We can't transform if we are unwilling to be uncomfortable. That's, that's a great way to put it. And, and I think just growth in general uh, never happens within our comfort zone period. That's so yeah. true. That's so true. And, and I'll tell you, I see so many people, they're so exhausted. And so, uh, and they, and they say, I'm so desperate to change. And they could be spending 10, 20, 30 years trying to heal from their betrayal. And what they're doing is they make the changes until they hit their comfort zone. And that's about to create a shakeup to their current you know, scenario, and they're like, mm -mm, forget it. And they go right back and they go back, they go back to that, you know, the edge of that comfort zone. And they're like, oh, this is going to shake up my world as I've known it. Forget it. And they spend a lifetime there. And that's why they're sick. And that's why they're miserable. And that's why they're, you know, they're, they're health tanks and they're unhappy in so many areas of life because you can't have that transformation in that same environment that's caused all that pain. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I don't know that people really understand how much it's all tied together, your, your mind, your spirit, everything. Um, You're so right. And, and we have so many people coming into the PBT Institute with therapy trauma, because let's say, first of all, let's say they have an amazing therapist. That's only dealing with it on one level. Betrayal hits you 
on every level and every level has to be addressed. But I'll tell you now that you know the stages, if there is anything that roots you to stage three like cement, it is going over your story endlessly every few days or every week with your therapist, not coming out of it with a plan to move forward. We see that all the time. So what, you know, you went through your own, your own betrayal and your own healing. Mm -hmm. Um, What was it that inspired you to want to, you know, start the Institute and, you know, help others get, through the same thing. Yeah. You know, I remember there was a moment um, and it was brutal. It was grueling. I mean, empathy and uh, uh, integrity is my highest value. And and I'm an empath. So I feel things so deep. And so could you imagine something like betrayal to an empath whose, whose highest value is integrity? It's like, it just doesn't get worse. But I remember going through the, the program and then going through the study and there was just this moment. And I remember thinking to myself, I can heal from this. I'm taking everybody with me. It was just one of those moments, you know, and, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll never forget when I was seeing clients at the time. Cause I, you know, I still was running my business and all I was doing was applying everything. The study was proving works. And I was seeing clients who were, you know, medicating and, and they were like, how are you doing this? I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm just doing what I'm learning. And then when the, when the five stages showed up, I was like, how do you make these discoveries and keep it to yourself? I mean, you know, that's, I have to get this out there. So I put the five stages in our sig- what has now become our signature program and it blew up. And then everyone wanted to see me. And I was like, well, what do I do? So I created our certification program. So coaches, doctors, healers, therapists can teach the five stages. And then uh, I knew that the wrong type of support does more harm than good. I knew, I did the research, I know what works. And I thought, okay, what would happen if I put everything that works under one roof, excluding everything the study proved doesn't work? That's the PBT Institute. That's cool. I love that. I love that. So where can people find you at now? Yeah, really everything is is there. The PBT as in post-betrayal transformation the pbt institute.com awesome um is there anything else that we didn't cover that you would like to to bring up before i get to my final question i'm sorry my my golden retriever here is uh, elbowing me so (laughs) you know Um, i would just say this i i know how painful it is uh i know that pain it's a pain like no other you know i what i would what i would say is i didn't do anything anyone else couldn't do and now there's a roadmap for it. So um, when you do something really good with something really painful, that's trauma well served. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I love the fact that you're, you're helping others and you're, you know, kind of turning your, uh, your test into a testimony, so to speak, for sure. So kudos for you and, uh, you know, love the, the work that you're doing and keep it up. Um, so that brings us to our final question. The subtitle of the podcast is Many Little People in Many Little Places, which comes from the opening lyrics of a Michael Fronte song, Gloria, which go, when many little people in many little places do many little things, then the whole world changes. So what's one of the little things that Dr. Debbie does on a daily basis to make the world a bit, little bit better place? I, I think it's, it's things like this. It's just getting this message of proven predictable healing Uh, out there so people don't have to struggle because if they heal, they impact everyone within their care and reach. Yeah. It really comes down to that ripple effect. You know, um, we're either going to have a ripple effect of healing or a ripple effect of, you know, continued trauma and, you know, not healing. So I I love that. I love the way you're, you're helping others get through it because I think it can be something that, um, you know, People spend their lifetime, like you said, just dying a slow, early death because they're ignoring it or, you know, trying to overlook it or do whatever they can to not deal with it. And it's like anything else. You got to deal with it head on. Um, Like I said, the caterpillar has got to go through that whole process to become a butterfly. And um, it's not, uh, I I love that. And, And I did write it down the hard now, easy later, or easy now, hard later, because it, it's a fact. I mean, it's. 
every what, single what are the other i mean you test you test the topic and it works yeah no doubt and, and just to, to to your point about the ripple effect think about it dan you're giving me a voice so it, the ripple is is there because if i had nobody to speak with that would share this message it stops with me and and uh this this healing is way too powerful so i am so grateful just to uh to have an opportunity to share it absolutely i'm, I'm happy to help where however i can so debbie i really appreciate you taking the time um, for our listeners out there be sure to check out my podcast and other blogs at journeymymotherson.com or danclauser.com and be sure to hop on over to as amazon pick up latest copy of my newest book journey my mother's son volume one while you're there you pick up some of dr debbie's books as well and uh debbie again i really appreciate you taking the time this is a great conversation thank you so much thank you